one of the most notorious serial killers in America, Ted Bundy was known for driving his young female victims into to indifference before brutally assaulting and killing them. Despite killing at least 30 women, Bundy went relatively unnoticed until August 16, 1975, when a routine traffic stop led to the discovery of numerous suspicious objects, including pantyhose, ski masks, crowbars, ice picks, and handcuffs. He soon became a suspect in the murders in the United States, and his final trial in June 1979 was the first to be televised nationally in the United States. Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell on November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont, to an unmarried mother's home. His mother was 22-year-old Eleanor Cowell, and until now the identity of her father has never been definitively known. Growing up, Bundy lived in Philadelphia with her aunts and grandparents. Bundy looked perfectly normal as a kid, for the most part. According to investigative journalist Kevin Sullivan, there is a moment from Bundy's childhood that foretells his future as a serial killer. It was reported that one of the aunts woke up one morning and Ted grabbed kitchen knives and pointed her to the bed, Sullivan said. This is our first sign that there may be a problem with the child. In 1950, Bundy and her birth mother moved to Tacoma, Washington, where she married a man named Johnny Culpepper Bundy, who adopted young Ted. They went to have four children. Bundy said she grew up in a Christian home with two dedicated and loving parents no drinking, smoking, gambling, fighting or physical abuse. But according to FBI profiler Bill Hagmeyer, Bundy fell in love with detective magazines filled with violent crime stories and how to get away with it as a teenager. A psychologist who evaluated Bundy told Snap Notorious that she experienced a lot of sexual relief through fictional stories. Bundy also explained in later interviews that his exposure to these magazines pushed him to seek violent pornography and types of stronger, more explicit, more graphic material. Around this time, Bundy was arrested twice on suspicion of burglary and auto theft, but details of both cases were erased from his record. At the age of 18, these minor disagreements with the law aside, Bundy was handsome socializer by his high school friends. Teachers make him model student. After graduating from high school in 1965, Bundy drifted between different colleges before enrolling in the University of Washington. A shy student, Bundy was insecure about his lower middle class upbringing and had nothing to offer to his peers. But in 1967, Bundy was a UW student. He had grown up in California in a wealthy and successful family that Bundy desperately wanted to be a part of. The two dated for less than a year and then broke off their relationship because he believed Bundy was directionless and was not confident. One detective told Snap Notorious that he was devastated by the breakup and that his rejection was a huge blow to Ted Bundy's ego. Many believe her rejection triggered Bundy's murder spree and likely motivated him to target women who looked like him. A detective told Snap Notorious she was bright and beautiful. He had long brown hair and was almost the spit image of all of Ted Bundy's victims. But in 1969, Bundy seemed to have progressed and started dating a young mother and a newly divorced woman. Besides taking classes and hanging out with his new girlfriend, Bundy got involved in politics and volunteered for Republican presidential candidate Nelson Rockefeller. She also worked on a Seattle suicide prevention hotline, where she met and worked with Anne Rule, a former police officer and up-and-coming crime writer. The rule described by Bundy in his book The Stranger Next to Me is kind, willing to his safety, and apparently empathetic. In 1972, Bundy graduated from UW. Hall of Fame the following year, he was accepted into law school at Puget Sound University. While it's disputed when Bundy started the killing, 
Bundy committed the first murder that police can definitively attribute to him in 1974, shortly after his last breakup with his college girlfriend. On January 4, Bundy broke into the home of 18-year-old University of Washington student Karen Sparks. Bundy beat him to death with a metal stick he used for sexual assault. He survived with permanent disabilities. Less than a month later, she broke into someone else's basement. UW student, 21-year-old Linda and Healy, whom he beat, kidnapped and murdered. On March 12, 1974, 19-year-old Donna Gail Manson left her Evergreen State College dorm room to attend a campus jazz concert when Bundy kidnapped and killed her. Bundy's fourth victim was 18-year-old Central Washington University student Susan Rancourt. Bundy pulled Rancourt into his Volkswagen Beetle by attaching a sling and asking him to help carry some books. Two female Central Washington students later stepped forward to report and said they had also been approached by a man calling them Ted. Roberta Kathleen Parks, 20, was abducted and assaulted to death from Oregon State University on May 6. Her skull was later found on Taylor Mountain. Bundy confessed to her murder shortly before his execution. Bundy's sixth victim, Brenda Ball, 22, was abducted to search for a car after leaving a Seattle tavern on June 1. Brenda was a pretty girl and one who friends would later say was sweet and caring. She hadn't yet found her place in the world, but at only 22, she should have had plenty of time to find it had she not crossed paths with Ted Bundy. On June 11, 18-year-old University of Washington student Georgia Ann Hawkins was abducted while walking a block between her boyfriend's dormitory and the sorority. On July 14, 1974, Bundy approached 23-year-old Janice Ott at Lake Sammamish State Park. He apparently asked her for help unloading a sailboat from his Volkswagen Beetle with his arm in a sling. He then kidnapped and killed her. Hours later, Bundy came to 19-year-old Denise Nasland, who was still in a hangar in the parking lot, and asked her for help. It was never seen again. According to many witnesses, both Ott and Nasland were seen talking to a man who identified himself as Ted. Another witness reported seeing a car that was later associated with Bundy a tan Volkswagen defect. As news of Washington's disappearances spread, police released a composite sketch and details of the suspect's car, including a description. Thousands of clues spilled out about Ted and his tan Volkswagen. At this point, Bundy had found a new job working in the Washington State Department of Emergency Services. According to the stranger next to me, Bundy's co-workers had mixed feelings about him. While some liked him, others thought he was lazy and a manipulator. He wouldn't show up for work most of the time and wouldn't bother telling his managers. Although they had no idea Bundy was responsible for the murders, for other people close to Bundy reported him to the police as a possible suspect. A professor at the University of Washington, his girlfriend, an employee from the Department of Emergency Services and in rule said they knew someone named Ted who fit the composite outline and drove a tan Volkswagen Beetle. Investigative journalist Kevin Sullivan told Snap Notorious that although Bundy is being looked after by the police, he looks so normal and is not the type of person to be a vicious killer. He was never questioned by the police. In August 1974, Bundy moved to Salt Lake City to attend the University of Utah Law School. That September, Ott and Naslund's remains were found near Lake Samamis in a forested area later called the Issaquah Dump Site. Bundy began killing again in the fall of 1974 from his new base in Salt Lake City. On October 18, 17-year-old Melissa Smith was abducted, raped and strangled by Bundy. Laura and Anne, 17, the daughter of a police chief, was abducted, raped, and strangled in Utah on Halloween night. On November 8, Bundy approached 18-year-old Carol Durant at a shopping mall in Murray, Utah, 
and police identified herself as Officer Roseland. According to the Los Angeles Times, Bundy told Durant that his car was broken and that he had to escort him to the police station in his Volkswagen. When Durant got into his car, Bundy attacked and tried to handcuff him. A detective told Snap Notorious that Bundy put on the first cuff but accidentally put the second cuff on the same arm. Durant managed to jump out of the car and throw a flag at a passing car, and Bundy drove away. The couple in the passing car took Durant to the police station, where they gave a description of the attacker. After Durant escaped, Bundy began trolling victims at a local high school. Bundy managed to lure 17-year-old Deborah Kent to the parking lot. It was never seen again. In January 1975, Bundy was also traveling deep into Colorado and Idaho in search of new victims. Their murders continued until that spring, with eight more women reported missing. On August 16, 1975, the captain of the Utah Highway Patrol noticed a suspicious vehicle in a Salt Lake City suburb in the early morning hours. As the Volkswagen Beetle sped away, the officer chased after the driver before stopping at an empty gas station. Officer Deseret told the news, he introduced himself as a sophomore law student at the University of Utah. Bundy said he got lost in the subsection. He acted normal. I couldn't smell alcohol or beer on his breath. He was a handsome young man. There was nothing to indicate that anything was wrong. Bundy gave the officer permission to search his car. And inside he found pantyhose, ski mask, crowbar, ice pick and handcuffs. Bundy was arrested on suspicion of absconding. According to Snap Notorious, Utah police were aware of the serial killings in Washington and had noticed that Bundy was from the Seattle area. They obtained a sketch of the suspect in the murders and realized that it was very similar to Durant's description of the assailant. Bundy's movements also matched the timeline of the murders and disappearances, and the female victims all fit the same profile. One detective snapped Notorious said, the victims were all in their late teens or early twenties and had similar physical descriptions. All of the recovered bodies were naked and most showed signs of blunt trauma, sexual assault, and mutilation. Bundy was placed in custody, and in September, Utah detectives flew to Seattle to interview Ted's girlfriend, who called the police a second time after women began disappearing in Utah. He had been in close contact with Bundy after he moved to Salt Lake City. His girlfriend told police about their time in Washington, Ted went out a lot at midnight and I didn't know where it was going. Then he slept during the day. And I found things, things I couldn't understand. These items included plaster of Paris, possibly for making plaster with the hanger ammo, crutches, a knife, meat knives, and a bag full of women's clothing. She also told the police that Bondi's sexual interests had changed and once asked her to try bondage. It went to the drawer where I kept my nylons. He seemed to know which drawer they were in. His girlfriend's hair, long, straight, and parted in the middle, was of interest to detectives, too. She said she loves Bundy's hair and explained, every time I talk about cutting it, she gets very upset. She really likes long hair. Of course, the only girl I've ever seen with me has hair just like mine. Detectives confirmed Bundy was not with his girlfriend at the time of the kidnapping and murders. With no DNA database or surveillance camera currently available, police had to rely on Carol Durancha's identity of Bundy. On October 2, 1975, Durant selected Bundy from a program and was arrested for his kidnapping. In February 1976, Bundy was found guilty and sentenced to 1 to 15 years in prison. Throughout the trial, Bundy maintained his innocence and denied any connection to other kidnappings and murders. 
Because of his upbringing and background, many could not believe that young law students were responsible for the brutal murders. On June 7, 1977, Bundy entered the law library during a recess. With the guard outside the library door, Bundy jumped out of the open second-story window and escaped. Bundy injured his ankle during the jump, but still managed to climb Mount Aspen. Bundy jumped out of this second-story window at the front of the Pitkin County Courthouse this morning. He was scheduled for a court appearance and apparently had been locked into the law library by sheriff's deputies while attorneys were arguing a motion to strike the death penalty. Witnesses say he left in a hurry, however, nobody saw him open the window, and he escaped clean in an unknown direction. At both ends of town, the sheriff's department put up roadblocks and searched each vehicle leaving the town of Aspen. As of late this afternoon, Bundy was still missing, but a court clerk said they'd arrested nine people on warrants and confiscated 200 pounds of marijuana. All day long, County Sheriff Dick Keenest has been circling over the wooded hills in a helicopter looking for the suspected rapist killer, but with no success. Ted Bundy, a Washington state resident, was convicted last year of the kidnap assault of a young woman from Salt Lake City. He's also the prime suspect in a series of murders of young women in Washington state, as well as the suspect in a murder case here in Aspen. This is Ward Lucas reporting from Aspen. According to the Times, even the town of Aspen wasn't immune from Bundy's charms. After hearing about the serial killer's escape, people wore t-shirts that read Ted Bundy one night out and a Bundy burger, a plain roll, was served at a restaurant. A sign in the restaurant read, Open it and see the meat escape, was written. Days after climbing the mountain, Bundy stole a car and tried to flee the city. But because of his stray wrist, he drove erratically and was pulled over during a routine traffic stop. He was immediately detained. Bundy was later placed in an isolated, maximum security cell. Welding on the ceiling, although it was a small hole from a required light fixture, no one in the prison believed that anyone could escape from it. Bundy suffered a dramatic weight loss while incarcerated. Investigative journalist Kevin Sullivan told Snap Notorious that inmates in other cells heard Bundy crawling on the ceiling at night. He went off and exploded a second time. He entered the guard's apartment above the cells and put on civilian clothes before escaping. Now on the FBI's most wanted list, Bundy then headed south and eventually settled in Tallahassee, Florida. On January 8, he entered a hostel. Under the name Chris Hangen. In the very early morning hours of January 15, 1978, Bundy entered the Chi Omega sorority at Florida State University. He beat and sexually harassed four women with a log from the garden of the sorority. He killed Margaret Bowman, 21, and Lisa Levy, 20. Both women were strangled and beaten. Bundy mutilated Levy, brutally bitten her nipple and hip and sodomized him with a hairspray bottle. Levy was found after a sorority attack. My first reaction when I saw Lisa was that we were under fire. I thought you were shot through the window. As I knelt next to him, I felt, I have to keep kneeling, I have to stay down. It never occurred to me that someone was in the room. His face was completely bloody and he continued to touch his mouth with his hands even though he was unconscious. She has just had her braces removed and somehow, I feel like the pain is braces. I tried to cover it. I was so worried about exposing her breast that she almost bit her nipple, but I thought it was a gunshot wound.
He also attacked Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler, both 21 years old. Bundy beat them and broke their jaws. Chandler has a skull fracture and Kleiner is missing several teeth. When Nita Neary, the sorority sister, returned home at around 3 a.m., Bundy heard the door slam and ran away from home. Neary later told police he saw a sharp, thin-nosed man come out of the house with a stick or a stick. Just blocks away, Bundy broke into the home of 21-year-old Cheryl Thomas. In Famous Snapped, Thomas and his two housemates, Debbie Ciccarelli and Nancy Young, talked about the horrific attack that occurred just an hour after the Chi Omega attacks. On the night of the attack, Thomas, Ciccarelli and Young had gone to a disco dance at a local bar. Thomas had gone to a disco dance at midnight. Around 4 a.m., Ciccarelli and Young were awoken by loud noises from Thomas's apartment. Snapped notorious, Ciccarelli said, We had no idea what was going on at Chio, but I had a sickening feeling that something was not quite right. He called 911 after Ciccarelli called Young's apartment and no one answered. When the police arrived, they kicked Thomas's door and found him severely beaten, but alive. Bundy had escaped again. According to court documents, Thomas was asleep at the time of the attack and was unable to identify the attacker. A pair of knotted pantyhose were found in the room and holes were drilled in the material to create a mask. Detectives later determined that Thomas had been beaten with the log he had used in the Chi Omega home. Emergency responders took Thomas to the hospital. He ran where he healed from a broken jaw and a severed nerve attached to his left ear. To date, Thomas has no memory of the brutal attack. After Bundy escaped, she went to Lake City, Florida, and kidnapped 12-year-old Kimberly Leach from her middle school on February 9, 1978. She showed signs of sexual and physical abuse when her body was found seven weeks later in a pigsty. On February 15, 1978, Bundy pulled over for another routine traffic stop. When pulled over by the police, he resisted arrest and tried to escape on foot. After giving them a false name, Pensacola cops did not realize who was detaining them in the first place. A few days later, Bundy interviewed the chief of police and introduced himself as Theodore Robert Bundy. A detective told Snap Notorious that Bundy matched Kimberly's physical description of the Chi Omega attacker, and the hairs and fibers from the car Bundy was driving matched leeches. Bundy was charged with the Florida attacks and murder. A pre-trial plea bargain was arranged under which Bundy would accept life sentences of at least 75 years without parole. However, at the hearing, Bundy refused the agreement and the case went to court. In June 1979, Bundy's trial was nationally televised in the United States. It was the first hearing to be published. Although Bundy never finished law school, he was allowed to represent himself again, and the judge appointed him attorney. The prosecution presented Neary's witness testimony as well as forensic dentist statements. To the bite mark Bundy left on Chi Omega sister Lisa Levy, who took casts of her teeth and matched them. Bundy was found guilty of murdering Levy and Margaret Bowman, three counts of attempted murder and two counts of theft. Sentenced to death A month after Chi Omega sentenced, Bundy was tried for the murder of Kimberly Leach. He was found guilty by tying Bundy to Leach's body with witness testimony and fiber evidence. During his conviction, Bundy had his former colleague of the Emergency Services Department, Carolyn Boone, testify as a character witness. He visited her in prison, standing by her innocence. She even moved to Florida to be closer to him. Still acting as his own defense, Bundy proposed to Boone in the midst of questioning him. Boone agreed and Bundy said, I will marry you. Carol, do you want to marry me? 
<laughs> Boone had contacted a notary to attend the hearing, and their marriage was later declared legal. On February 10th, Bundy was given another death sentence. When the sentence was read, she allegedly shouted, tell the jury they were wrong. A majority of the jury advised and recommend to the court that it impose the death penalty upon the defendant, Theodore Robert Bundy, dated this 9th day of February 1980 in Orlando, Orange County, Florida. Yes. Bundy sat with his back to the judge during the reading of the recommendation. Then, one last outburst as the jury was being released. Bundy spent nine years in prison before being executed. During her time on death row, Boone remained by her husband's side. He did. Although wedding visits were not allowed, Boone became pregnant with Bundy's child. She gave birth to their daughter, Rose Bundy, in October 1982. While awaiting his execution date, Bundy gave a series of interviews, notably with FBI profiler Bill Hagmeyer. Hagmeyer told Snapped Notorious that Bundy did not confess to any murders during his first three years. Would refer to serial killer. Later, Bundy tried to extend his time before he was sent to the electric chair. He wanted clarity on who he killed, how he killed them, and where their bodies were. Detectives from Washington, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho came to Florida State Penitentiary to speak with Bundy about the murders. Snapped Notorious, a Washington detective said, he hoped we would speak to Florida's governor and attorney general on his behalf, but we knew Florida would do nothing. During his death row confessions, Bundy admitted to being involved in at least 30 murders in seven states between 1973 and 1978. He also opened up about the motivations behind the murders and the order is not just a crime of lust or violence. It becomes property. They are a part of you. You feel their last breath coming out of their body. You look into his eyes. The person in this situation is God. Bundy revealed that he would frequently revisit his victims after they were killed. He told Hagmir, the fresher the find, the more likely it will come back. I don't think he'll be back to see the skeletal remains, though I can't say for sure that he won't. Bundy admitted to dealing with death and shampooing one victim's hair and applying makeup to the other. He told Hagmir, if you have the time, they can be anyone you want them to be. He also admitted to taking pictures of his victims. The explanation is, when you work hard to get something right, you don't want to forget it. Bundy's execution for the murders at the Chi Omega sorority was scheduled for March 4, 1986, but his stay was ordered by the Supreme Court. Before an exact execution date for Leach's murder was set as January 24, 1989, defense attorneys cited multiple technical details. Other dates came and went. After Bundy's confessions, Boone returned to Washington with his daughter because he had deeply betrayed her, confessing publicly without telling her. Little has been reported about Boone and Rose since then. Bundy spoke to Hagmeyer about committing suicide the night before his execution. Hagmeyer said, he did not want to give the state the joy of watching him die. We had some discussion about morality, his concerns about taking another life and trying to explain his actions to God. At 7.16 a.m. on Tuesday, January 24, 1989, Ted Bundy was pronounced dead. After being electrocuted at Florida State Penitentiary, while strapped to the electric chair, he told his lawyer and a minister, give my love to my family and friends. A crowd of about 200 gathered outside the prison gates and cheered after being informed of his death. In the next section, the inside story of Ted Bundy's execution, from his last meal to his final words. 10 Shocking Facts About the Last Days and Execution of Ted Bundy Rose Bundy, 
the true story of Ted Bundy's daughter conceived on death row.